right, welcome to technical session number seven. We're going to be getting into RAM or random access memory. Got a lot to go through with this. We're going to be defining system memory and describe how the different technologies work on a kind of surface level. We're going to articulate the process, including key questions to answer when you want to upgrade your memory. Determine how to select and purchase the right memory module for you. Um, summarize the process of installing the memory. Identify some common pitfalls per usual. And then <clears throat> some common problems that come up and describe how we would work through them. For this particular BSM, we're going to want to try to keep in mind adaptability and persistence, as we did this morning. Um, we have concluded our BSM tour for right now, getting introduced to the eight that we typically use, but we will keep reintroducing them, re-reminding you and working them in wherever we can because it takes two months to develop a new habit. We have three here, so we have a little bit of extra time and we can try to ingrain these things in our daily life so that we can carry them on as we go forward. All right, some key terms for memory. When we are speaking about RAM, which is random access memory, this is a term we would use called volatile, excuse me, volatile, not voluntary, volatile memory. And that basically means that all the contents on the volatile memory is lost when power is turned off. If you remember, we talked about this with regards to the BIOS um, settings and the CMOS battery helps maintain that trickle of power because if it's lost, it resets all the settings. That is a type of volatile memory. Then you have the opposite of that, which is your non-volatile memory, which retains its contents when the power is turned off. Examples of this include flash drives, hard drives, things like that, where you would store things long-term data-wise. <clears throat> Unbuffered memory deals directly with your chipset controller. So it is receiving its instructions from the chipset controller. Buffered memory contains a buffer that helps the chipset handle large amounts of memory and large electrical loads. This is typically seen in servers, not so much in desktops or personal computers. And then pretty straightforward, you have single-sided and double-sided RAM. This basically, I mean, outside of the speed bonuses you get from it, Easy way to identify it is single-sided has chips on one side of the RAM module, double-sided has chips on both sides of the RAM module. That's a quick identifier for it. All right, our definition of memory. Joseph, can you read for us, please? Memory definition. Area within a computer where information is stored while being worked on, Information is stored by using on or off switches, where on equals one and off equals zero. When strung together, these switches can represent large numbers and code values. Excellent. Thank you. So we talked about this Tuesday, I believe. We're talking about binary, which is the machine code, the what, what computers actually read. And remember, we talked about it as if it was a switch, on or off. That's the only thing it can do, on or off. And then the series in which things get turned on and off is what tells the computer what to do. So memory stores that information while it's being worked on and allows it to be used in more manageable chunks. Now, we were talking earlier today about firmware, which typically is that chip that has instructions predetermined on it and that is also called a ROM chip, not RAM, ROM, R-O-M, which stands for read only memory. So this is non-volatile, which means it does not lose its, its information when the power is lost and permanent, technically, which means you cannot change the instructions upon it. The types of information that we store in there, like when we're talking about the BIOS, it's the BIOS programs, your post routines, boot instructions, things like that. And underneath the ROM family, there are three types of ROM. So you have PROM or programmable ROM, which means you are allow it allows you to program the instructions onto it a single time. That's it. You get one chance, you put the instructions on it, and that is it. 
<clears throat> this is that is a more old, like an older version of ROM. Then you have EEPROM and EEPROM, which allows you to overwrite those instructions and update it and review it over time. And the main difference between EEPROM and EEPROM is how it is the, the uh, information is erased. Interestingly, on EEPROM, they use UV light to, in, to erase the instructions on the chip itself. In EEPROM, which is the most common what we see today, it can actually use electricity to, like an electrical signal to erase the instructions on it. So both of the EEPROM and EEPROM allows you to continue to update the instructions as you need, but it's just the manner in which the information is erased, which is different. Yes, Ramon. So how would you put the information on it? Well, typically before it is soldered down to the board, it is docked into a machine that will actually write the instructions onto it. That's the initial writing of the directions. <clears throat> so that would happen before we ever receive it. And then they're typically soldered down. So the programmable ROM is already programmed before we see it, typically. And then EEPROM, same way, but we're able to update it later on, like flashing the BIOS as an example. Does that answer your question? Yeah. So in the initial writing is usually done in an industrial environment, like a manufacturing environment. All right. So now we get into RAM, which is the bulk of what we're talking about through this particular technical session. And we have a few different types of that. We have DRAM or DRAM, uh, dynamic RAM. So it holds information for only a fraction of a second before it erases and it keeps refreshing constantly. Sorry, bear with me one second here. I just gotta close the door. Sorry about that, things are getting a little exciting. All right, so we have our dynamic RAM. Uh, like I said, it holds it for just about a fraction of a second, then it refreshes. And um, it's constantly being refreshed. Unfortunately, if something is continuously being refreshed and having to keep adding that information back to it every fraction of a second, then it's going to slow it down, reduces the performance. So this is not something typically used today. And you have your you have two different types of packages, like we talked about, we have single inline memory modules and dual inline memory modules. That's where we have the chips on one side or both sides. Yes, Casey. Would that be used for something more like programs nowadays instead, like Snapchat or something where most of the data should all be like deleted or? Good possibility, but unfortunately the servers that you're talking about that would deal with that, no. That's going to be a little more software um, side where they they want the code to be essentially erased on a regular basis versus like holding it for a fraction of a second and dropping it. So a good, um, I like where your head's at on that one though. But yeah. All right. Next, we talk about SRAM or static RAM. This retains the information without the need for refreshing so long as it holds uh, power, it holds that information, like our BIOS settings, right? So as long as it is on, or excuse me, CMOS RAM is similar to that. And this is volatile. So long as it has power, it maintains this, the information that is on it. As soon as power is lost, everything's gone. CMOS RAM is a version of that. Uh, memory uses a small battery, keeps it volatile. State always is retained. As long as that trickle power from the battery is there, configuration data and settings are maintained. And then finally, we get down to SDRAM, which is the most common type you will see nowadays. This is usually when somebody's talking about RAM, this is what they're talking about, which is synchronous dynamic RAM. And this is meant to operate as your computer is operating at that speed. It synchronizes with the system to allow for the highest efficiency possible. 
<clears throat> and it's going to match the quote unquote frequency or speed of the system. We're going to look in, in a few minutes and see how that is calculated and where that information comes from. So it's going to try to be as efficient with the bus speed on your systems as it possibly can. So just basic definitional information at this point. So SD RAM, like we said, most common, used in most modern systems. Holds the data that the CPU needs while the CPU is trying to make computations. And it is co and it's connected through the North Bridge because why would we connect it to the North Bridge RAM? Anybody? What does the North Bridge do? Um, it deals. Well, Artez, were you about to go? I speak the. Yeah, I, I was just go I was going to say um, it sends the information the fastest to the computer. That is exactly what I'm looking for, Artez. Thank you. It is the fastest connection. So if it is working in tandem with the CPU, holding onto instructions while the CPU is working on it, we need the fastest possible communication, right? So it has to go through the North Bridge. Excellent. <clears throat> Another name that they can use for the North Bridge is the MCC or Memory Controller Chip. All right. Again, the RAM, since it is synchronizing with the system, it is tied to your system clock. So that is going to be a big determining factor of how fast it can operate. <clears throat> and it also allows for as little wasted time as humanly possible. All right. So what is form factor? What do we mean when I say form factor? What is, what is that just a fancy way of saying? Size. Size or shape. Size or shape. Excellent. Size or shape. So you'll hear this word used quite a lot throughout this, the hardware portion of this form factor, size and shape. All right, so we have our standard DIMMs, which are the average desktop size right here. You can see that right here. So that is a standard size memory module. And then they have the, what is called the SODIM, which is typically used in laptops as seen down here and the SO stands for small outline. If you can remember that, you always know it is a smaller version of it. So SODIM, typical laptops. And then you have what are called sub notebooks, which possibly includes the Chromes, um, Air, like was it the MacBook Airs, stuff like that, smaller um, systems that are gonna use less processing power. They would hold micro DIMMs which is an even smaller outline than the sodium itself. So you have standard dual inline memory module, sodium for small outline, and then micro is even smaller than that. Any questions so far? Are we ready and excited to do math? Yes, Kelly, so don't do that, man. <laughs> what would ha what would happen if you put like two of them on the same slot? What do you mean if you put two of them on the same slot? Like, like if the micro dim like was the only was half and as then big the micro and on the, yeah, and the same one, what would happen? I don't think they would be able to communicate properly. Okay. No, I think you would just get a post error when you try to turn it on. This isn't the same, like I think what you like you're talking about, like we were talking about um what was it up? Uh, where's brain brain draws it? Up socketing when you put the small like the nick card with the small outline in the um, yeah PCIe sixteen. Same. Yeah, it's not the same. It doesn't work that way. But interesting okay. question. I do like that one. Yes, Babukar. Oh, uh, what happened to the name uh, DDR one, DDR two, DDR three for RAMs? Like we haven't got it anymore. We haven't oh, got there yet. Okay. Cool. You're like you're like two or three slides ahead of me. So we will get there, Bobocar. <clears throat> All right. So this is what Bobocar was talking about right here, which is DDR. Um, so you would typically have the SD RAM, 
but then they you know wanted to be able to double the amount of data that could be transferred for every particular cycle and so we would have ddr or double data rate and what this is is it allows the information see so like like just normal sd ram you have to think about the clock speed like we said like a metronome uh you know in music so on a normal like four four setting if you have a whole note for every beat of the clock or oh, excuse me a one one sorry but for every beat of the clock you get one pulse of data so it operates like a whole note and then when you double the data rate where the clock is up and you know it's pulsating now it can send a pulse at the top of the clock speed and at the bottom of the clock speed so now you got half notes so it's able to manipulate the clock and send two pulses per clock cycle so we got half notes how it's calculated is you have your base clock speed which is 100 megahertz this is an easy way to look at it when we double the data rate we double it from 100 to 200 so just times two right easy straightforward <clears throat> and then from there to get our pc speed rating we have to multiply that by eight and that's where that number comes from that you see on the side of your ram modules so let's see if they have it on here if you can see it uh, they don't have it where i can see it so you have a pc speed rating so you double the data rate multiply eight and it gives you your pc speed rating will you have to calculate this you might get a question on it i'm looking for more general understanding as to where this is coming from so doubling your data rate half notes two pulses a clock cycle any questions on that Can you go over the math again? So for the first one, for example, it's 100 megahertz and then you double it so it becomes 200 and then you times yes. it by eight, so it's 1600. So everything to get your PC speed rating, once you once you have figured out your, <clears throat> your speed rating from your DDR <clears throat> or from your RAM has to be multiplied by eight. And that gives you your PC speed rating because of where you know, everything's pulsing in like octets essentially. Got it, that's always a solid rule for these, right? Yes, so Thank you're you. doubling your data rate, so DDR, one you're doubling the data rate one time so times two gives us this rating which is at 200 and then to get our pc speed rating we have to multiply by eight so we'll put a pin in that for a moment and another thing to try to make note of ddr ones the dims use 184 pins these questions do come up so you're aware so maybe take a screenshot so dims have 200 pins and micro dims have 172 pins can you repeat that sure dim DIMMs or dual inline memory module for DDR1 have 184 pins. So DIMMs or small outline DIMMs for laptops have 200 pins. And micro DIMMs for subcomputers have 172 pins. All right. Dual channel technology, we briefly mentioned this when we were talking about motherboards earlier, and this is where you would have RAM bakes that operate instead of just having a single module working independently, you can have two modules working together, and that is dual channel. They also have triple and quad channel, where triple would be three modules working together, quad would be four modules working together. Thankfully, many computer designers or, or motherboard designers with the exception of the gaming ones, because remember, aesthetic reasons, they make it look the way it is. They will alternate the colors of your RAM banks to make it easy for you to identify 
which ones should go together because if you're installing memory your banks are going to alternate so if i have dual channel on this computer here the two red banks go together and the two black banks go together so it would be bank one and three and two and four i wouldn't put them in one and two i couldn't run a dual channel that way so thankfully when they designed it they just made it a little bit easy for us to pick up on it and we insert our memory in that fashion. But as always, when in doubt, please refer to the literature that was given to you with your motherboards. Questions on this? Mm, what's throughput? Throughput? That is how much information it can push through on a single pulse. So over here, um, I think it's like 32 bits per pulse. So if you have dual channel, it can do 64 bits per pulse. You get what I'm saying? That's what we're talking about throughput. So if normally I can push through, let's just say 16 bits, if I can push 16 bits of information every time it pulses, if I double my throughput with, with dual channel, that's 32 bits I can push every pulse, right? So I'm doubling the amount uh, of information I can push through at one time. Does that make sense, Amir? All right. Donald, I will answer that question. Or Donnie, I'll answer your question on Coursera as soon as we wrap up on this one, I promise you. I was replying to someone else. Let's, work, let's work on RAM, man. We're in RAM. We're not in Coursera, we're in RAM. <laughs> we'll get to Coursera, I promise you. All right. So, DDR2, let's crank it up a notch. So if DDR1 double date sing, a single double double data rate doubled it, if we go to a level two, we're doubling that data rate twice now. So we're able to operate in now quarter notes. So we had whole notes for just SD RAM. DDR1 gave us half notes. Now we're in uh, quarter notes. So if we're operating, um, here we go. Our normal core clock speed, 100, multiply it by two, gives us our DDR1 rating, which is 200, multiply it by two, gives us our DDR2 rating, so it gets us up to 400. So we're doubling that speed again. So we doubled it once, we're doubling it again. And then now to get our PC rating, just like we did before, times eight. So 400 times eight grants us 3,200. If you have to calculate anything like this on the exam, it will be very simple and straightforward. You will not need a calculator. We're not gonna give you like this big obscene funky number. It's gonna be relatively easy where you can break it down. So is this making sense? We're just doubling it again. Doubling it again. Good morning, Joseph. Yes. <laughs> I was saying good morning, Joseph. I'm trying to okay. keep him awake. Try not to try not to bore you guys too much, I promise. All right. Crank it up again, same thing. So we're doubling the data rate again, times you know 100, time, double it, gives us 200, gives us our DDR1, double it again, gives us our DDR2, which is 400, double it yet again, 800 for DDR3, PC3, or the PC rating, will be 6,400. On the side of a RAM module, these are the numbers you will typically see. 
And so this is where these numbers are coming from. Yes, Ramon. So would the DDRs always like have these numbers on them when you look at them from like one to three, and then you would have to match it to the PC rating to what you have? Well, typically what the, yeah, what the RAM is, it, you know, you will see on the side of it is typically the 6400, but this is where these calculations are coming from because RAM modules are typically going to be set up based off of certain megahertz. They will work with certain megahertz. So, but specifically, this is this is how they get to those numbers. <clears throat> so let me jump back to this real quick, just because I didn't cover it real quick. Um, DDR twos, the uh, the DIMMs, the dual inline memory modules for the desktops, two hundred and forty pins. Sodium has 200 pins for DDR2. Let me get up here. So you have DIMMs with 240 pins and then sodium with 204 pins. Another and question. Also, so, sorry, what uh, would use a, a 288 pin then? I think you're getting up into the DDR5 or 6 at that point. Oh, okay. So that's where they are at nowadays. They get up in, I think we had DDR4, DDR, I think DDR5 is where they're at right now. So I probably need to double check me on that one. But I believe that's where we are capped right now is DDR5, and that might use the 288. All right, any questions on this? Again, you don't need to be perfect on this. You just need to basically have a general idea as to where these numbers are coming from. So when you're looking for RAM, your speed rating, your PC speed rating, the higher that is, the faster your RAM is. And you just have to make sure that your system is capable of handling it. What would you typically use that much RAM for? Is it like editing stuff, like videos and things like that? Or coding? What, DDR3? Yeah. You probably or, have that in your computer right now. No, I mean, like the higher ones, you said there's like up to DDR5 now. So what would you use that much uh, RAM newer for? Newer gaming computer, the newer computers coming out are in that generation and using that RAM. Got it. Yeah, I have a Mac, so I don't do any gaming. <laughs> so yeah. what would be using DDR5 uh, uh, server, or not servers, but like, just the more modern, that's the, that is the more modern ones. So that's the one they'll be using. So, you know, you have, that's the base speed and then how much memory it can store is where you start talking about, you know, what you would use it for. Like if you're, you know, for standard everyday use, two to four gigs probably get you by. Um, heavier use, like if you're going to be doing streamings, you know, and stuff like that, a little bit heavier, you probably need eight to 16. Um, so it depends on what you're using for, how many gigs of RAM you need. So that would be a little bit of a different thing versus what the speed rating of it is. Make sense? Or did I, did I make it worse? If I make it worse, please tell me. Yes, Brianna. Um, can you go over how you get the where the numbers come from for DDR3 again? Yes, I can do that. Just uh, let me go back to this Blanca for Blanca needed that for one second. Okay. Everybody always wants more RAM, Eric. It doesn't matter how much you have, you always want more. That's the that's the question when anybody goes, how much RAM can I, you know, how much RAM do I need? As much as you can handle, as much as you want, <laughs> or you or you want to pay for. All right, give me one second here. Are you good, Blanca? Yeah, okay, good. All right, let me go back to our DDR3 numbers. Okay, so much like before, we'll use the simplest example up here. So up here, they went to DDR2, they skipped over the DDR. 
So that's where the confusion might come in. So you have your 100 and a times two, which gets us to 200 for our DDR, right? And then to get to our DDR two, we have to double again, so times two, and that gets us to 400. If you want to use algebra, it could just be two to the power of X and then X yes, be you whatever can, yes. the name of I the RAM. Yes, you can use that as your, uh, yeah. And then double it yet again, sometimes two, gets you to 800. And then once you have your final speed for your DDR rating, so that's times three, at the end, you always multiply it by eight to get your PC speed rating. Do the same rules apply for DDR2? Yes, except we're only doubling it twice. So, bum, 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 give me one second. It's two, two, and then why, why eight at the last minute? Because I, I, they're measuring it, I guess, in octets for the pulses, so eight bits. So it's able to pulse in bits of eight. That is my understanding. So back to our DDR2, same thing. You have core speed rating times two, gives you your DDR1, which is 200. Double it again, gives us 400, and that gives us our DDR2. And then to get our speed rating, multiply it by eight. Again, you don't have to be perfect at this. It's more just an understanding where the numbers are coming from. Okay, so. So if you see a PC speed rating and it's a DDR3, you would divide it by like 3,200, put, you know, divide it by eight, that would get you down to 400, half it, half it, you know. But again, you may receive one question on this on your A+. I'm more focused on you just getting a general understanding of where these numbers are coming from. Okay. So when you look on the side of a RAM, you know, RAM module, you kind of get where it's going. So in essence, the higher your PC speed rating is, the faster the RAM is able to um, process. All right, DDR4, same process, carried over one more time. Oh, there's that 288 pin, that's DDR4. Sorry about that, Ramon. So DDR4, 288 pin right there not backwards compatible. So exact same process we just did, except for doubling it one more time. Any questions on that? All right. No. Nope. All right. So um, if you remember back when we were talking about motherboards light years ago this morning, um, we also talked about the generations of the, the cards and the various voltages that it could handle and how <clears throat> they move the notch around based on the type of expansion card it is. Uh, Babakar mentioned that they do this with RAM as well. Here is a description of it. So you can see visibly they move the notch around based upon which type of RAM. That way you cannot use the wrong type of RAM in your current motherboard. It won't go in, it'll just teeter. So you won't be able to lock it in. And it's just a quick reference check right before you put the RAM module in, you lay it down kind of at an angle, put it up next to the slot. You can see if the notch lines up, if it does, then you should be good to roll. Questions on that? Next thing we gotta talk about real quick is latency. Latency is just kind of a fancy word for delay. In form factor, shape and size, latency means delay. So we can see our PC speed rating, which is right here on the RAM. And then we have a CL number, or it'll be CAS or CL. And this number is our latency number. 
And we want that to be as low as possible because we want as minimal delay as we possibly can get before it starts to process the information. So you have the speed rating that we want to be as high as possible and our latency number that we want to be as low as possible. So of these two, the upper and the lower, let's see here, this is what happens with Enrique, which one of these two would be the better option? The one on the top. The one on the top, why? Because it has a lower latency. Excellent. Lower latency, so it is going to be, it's going to have a faster reaction time. The, I mean, honestly, you'll see the difference in the price. Because the lower that number gets, the higher the price tag gets. You know, I did uh, a few years ago, changed uh, one of those things on my laptop. I, I didn't know about all that stuff. It did make it faster, though. Mm -hmm. But I didn't know if I knew all this stuff that you uh, that we're talking about now, I would have probably gotten a better, <laughs> you know. But uh, it did make it faster. It did make it better. Yeah, I mean, the, in, in the end, the question is, is if it was really worth the money to you. If you got what you wanted yeah. out of it, monetary, you know, like if if it was worth the price tag, then that's fine. Yeah, yeah I guess it, you know. it was. But yeah, but now you, you kind of understand where these numbers are coming from. And if you're looking at like, well, they're both DDR3, you know, they're both DDR3 modules and they, they have the same speed rating. Why the heck is this one more expensive than the other? Oh, it's probably just name brand. No, it's likely the latency issue that they're talking about. So in the one with the lower latency, that's, you know, the one that's going to be the higher price tag. All right. Kelly, I have a quick question. Yes. What were they using before 1997, 98? Because I know the DDR once came out around nine, end of 97, 98. So before then, what were they using? Well, before they weren't using dual data rate, they were using just SODIMS, but they didn't have the dual data rate yet. Okay. 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 Cool. Thank mm -hmm. you. So DDR is that is specifically stating double data rate. So that is where they're able to double the the pulse of the, the, the information pulses per cycle. Eric. Um, yeah, so I was curious and I took out uh, just the random RAM stick that I have laying around mm -hmm. and I don't see the little CL thing. So when we don't Is see there the- CAS on there? CAS. Yeah, no. Yeah, so what, how, is there a way to figure out the clock cycles with uh, like maybe digitally or another way by looking at it? Well, by looking at it, usually it would be either on the, the tag or the packaging. Okay. Uh, and, and much like GP, like the graphics cards nowadays, RAM modules are enclosed too. And some of them, they add fancy, you know, LED lighting on them and stuff like that. I mean, um, so typically that would be in the packaging but there is a way that the computer knows every time, which is there's a tiny little chip right here in the middle of all those, these bigger ones. So there's a little tiny chip we'll talk about a little bit later called the SBD or SPD, excuse me. Okay. And that's digitally how you would know. All right, cool. Thank you. Mm -hmm. No problem. Oh, I love talking about this particular one. So... This also becomes relevant a little bit later. So we do need to talk about this for just a minute or two. I'll try to make it as brief as I can. So in RAM, there are also data integrity measures that can be put in place. So you have what is called parity, which is a me measure or an IOA way of kind of ensuring that the data that was sent is actually what was supposed to have been received. So it's a way to verify that what I received was supposed to be what was sent. And they use something that's called parity. And what they do is they use an extra bit of data to check it. And if it comes across, and it's basically like a game of odd or even. And that extra bit tells you whether it's supposed to be odd or even. And if it comes across as a different number, like if it's supposed to be odd and it comes across as even, 
it drops that group and asks you to resend because it knows it doesn't match up. That wasn't supposed to be what was sent. I need the correct information. So it drops it, requests you resend it. And that's parity. I'll explain that here in just a minute. I'll show you exactly kind of how, or like for the most part, how it works. Um, so the memory controller chip uses this extra bit to verify the data was absolutely correct. And this is what I was supposed to get, but it can't correct it. It just drops it and says, resend. And how this works, I'm going to use just four bits of data just to kind of give you a picture on it. So let me draw four boxes here. Four. All right. And then we will add a fifth bit to the, uh, the data that it sent. And this will be our parity bit. And what you're doing with the with the bit, how you determine it is, is the bit is trying to make everything even. So if the data I'm sent is one, zero, zero, one, I add it all up. One plus zero plus zero plus one. It's even, right? It's an even number. I don't need to make it even at this point because it's already even. So my parity bit will be a zero. Does this make sense? So. Did the tree fall? Okay, I'll check out in just a second. All right. So let's just say, for example, it goes one, zero, zero, zero. And this would be a one to make it even, right? Absolutely. That is exactly what it's saying. And all you have to worry about with parity is odd or even that's all you're looking for and you know so if i if um the data comes across we'll do we'll use your example one zero 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 horrible handwriting um and this is a zero what does that tell me it's not even it's not even. So what? What is it? What oh, happens? He sends one? it back. It's on. wrong, right? It's not correct. This is not the data I was supposed to receive. So what does it do? It drops it and says, "I need you to resend, please." So that's how parity works. Does that make sense to everybody? All all that extra bit is doing is making the whole series even, and it's so it's able to tell if the information is not correct just by that. Yes, Brianna. Oh, you answered. I was going to ask, does this mean even means that it's right? And you just said it. So, yeah. So the parity bit makes it even. And so long as that matches up, you're good. So that is base. <clears throat> excuse me. That is basic parity. We will revisit parity again when we talk about RAID devices. So we will talk about this again. It does come up again. All right. So now. We know what parity is. So now we can talk about the next level up from this, which is ECC or error correcting coding. And this is a type of RAM module. And this is like a step up from parity and it's really cool. This module can actually fix an error on the fly. So it doesn't have to drop it and re-request it. So it saves a little bit of time in that manner, but it, it can say like if one bit was missing, like a bit got dropped. It can look at the parity bit and say, yep, I know what that's supposed to be and add it back in. So in situations where data integrity is really important, you can use ECC RAM in order to kind of do this, these kind of calculations on the fly, but it can only correct an error of a single bit. So if there's multiple bits missing, it will drop and request to resend. It can only fix a single bit of error, but that is still very helpful. Um, unfortunately, it's slower than other types of RAM at the same speeds because it's doing these calculations on the fly. So it's typically used in servers where data integrity would be important, like, you know, research and development, uh, documentation, financial records, all that stuff. Data integrity is important. That would be a good place to have something like this, not in a gaming PC, but it's also more expensive. So you kind of use it where you need it. So from a calculation perspective, 
if information comes across and it is one, one, blank, zero, and this is a one, what bit is missing? Bobo Car. Or did you have a question? I have a, I have a question. That's All right, well, let's go through this real quick and then I'll get your question. Mm -hmm. So who can tell me what is missing? So I got one, one, blank, zero, but I have a parity bit of zero. one. A zero. Would it be a zero? One. One. We have some disagreement. It would be one. It would be odd. If it was a one, one. it would be odd. One. Be. There you go. It's missing a one because for that one to be there, it needs to be an odd number in that information that was sent. So the ECC looks at that, sees that missing data bit and goes, okay, I just need to plug a one in there and I'm good to go. Now it doesn't typically do this in four bits. It's usually a much larger string, but I'm just using four to kind of give you an idea as to what's, what it's doing. So, but that is how parity and error correcting code work with regards to RAM. Uh, yes, Babu Car. Let's go with your question now. Okay. Uh, uh, is parity uh, RAM still available, or were they like available during before the nineties? Because I know most of the recent new RAMs they already you know had the uh, ECC coded in, whereby it kind of uh, invisibly like you know rectify errors. You know, to my knowledge, it. I mean parity RAM. I'm sure you can find it, but it, in this case, it's more understanding exactly what parity is doing. Because in order to understand ECC and how it's correcting it, you have to understand parity. Parity, okay. Yeah. Makes sense. Mm -hmm. Makes mm -hmm. sense. Thank you. No problem. Is this clear? Is this is this like kind of make sense as to how it's working? I have a, a question. Yes, uh, in the last in the last uh, example you just show us, what mm -hmm. will be the, if uh, it will it was Parity. Answer. Well, if, if, the if, if, it, if it was parity yeah. and this came across and there was a missing bit, mm. it would instantly just drop it and say, please resend. So mm. it would request the information again. Okay. So, but ECC, error correction coding, can fix this on the fly and correct it right there on the spot and doesn't need to ask for it to be sent again. Okay. So right. the parity will the parity will keep on dropping it and asking to resend while you correct. rectify it until it's correct. Yes. Before it accepts it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes, Eric. I'm sorry, I have a question. Um so these these methods of data into integrity and uh, error detection, uh how are these used like within the servers and stuff like that like are they use, using programs or like how are they how are they well you would use this in like data centers and stuff like that where you're trying to maintain the highest level of data integrity you know like like i said with financial records you know if you have proprietary information for your company research and development data integrity is critical to you so you want to make sure that the information you're storing is actually getting there or if you're running backups on your entire systems that you're have the highest level of integrity possible okay okay does that make sense yeah a little bit yeah okay again if i explain something and it makes it worse tell me i will find another way to explain it yes george i'm a little lost on the odd and even thing why does it have to be either odd or even i'm a little lost on that so for for example the selection we had before um do you mean like even a number of ones and zeros or is it just a total number together? That's kind of where you lost me. Okay, well, so here's my data set right here. So that this is when we're talking about whether we're checking whether it's odd or even, this is our data set. The parity bit here, what determines whether it's a one or zero is if, so if this is a, uh, a zero here, da -da, if that is a zero, the whole goal for the parity bit is to signify whether this is an even or an odd number. And they do this by making the number even. 
So what it does is if it's already even, it doesn't need to change anything, right? Because it's already even. So our parity will be zero at that point because the number is already even. We don't need to do anything. So zero ind indicates it's even, good to go. If this was a one, it was an odd number, then in order to make it even to get parity, we would put a one there. So then it turns it into an even number. So all the parity bit is doing, the only thing it really does is indicating whether it's supposed to be an odd number I received or an even number I received. And if it doesn't match up, it means your data is corrupted, a bit got dropped or something is not right. So parity says, drop it, resend. Error correcting code, if it's a single bit, just says here, I know that's supposed to be a one. So I'll drop that in there for you. Thank you. Uh-huh. Oh. All right. Uh, what's MCC from the note? Memory uh, controller chip. OK. So that's basically what's controlling the communication between the CPU and the RAM. That makes sense? Cool. All right. Excellent. Now that we are all experts on parity. All right, so getting into register and buffer memory. So memory that has a register between the memory, essentially memory and the controller. The register kind of stores the information <clears throat> so that information can be written simultaneously. So it kind of speeds things up a li little bit. It reduces the load on the controller chip, the MCC. So it doesn't have to work as hard because it's under, you know, it knows what needs to be done. And it allows you to get much more done in, a, in the same amount of time than you could without the register. Typically, again, like ECC, this is used in servers. It's more expensive and it's more useful in a server environment rather than on a PC environment. <clears throat> because kind of like ECC, the extra processing power within the RAM slows things down a bit. We don't want to see that on a PC, but if we're looking for data integrity on our, on our data servers, we don't care if it runs a little bit slower as long as the information that on there is true and correct. And it's not as noticeable because it doesn't take a lot of time to, to load a quick Excel spreadsheet, right? But you will notice lag if you're trying to run a video stream. So think of it in terms like that. All right, access speed. For your RAM, this is measured in nanoseconds. And this is the time it takes the RAM to provide the requested data to the memory controller itself. And that's where the latency kind of comes in. <clears throat> we need to make sure that the memory we're adding on is either the same speed or faster than the existing memory we have in place. If you are running memory banks, don't mix and match. It may work slower. More than likely, it won't work at all if you mix and match. So you don't put a two gigabyte uh, DDR3 in with a eight gigabyte DDR3 in the same memory bank. It's not gonna work right. So don't mix and match. What about the same type of RAM, but from different manufacturers? That would be fine. Okay. I'm doing that right now. Cool. Wait, so that you, you just said, um that you don't want to mix and match RAM? Yes, so I don't want low latency DDR3 uh, eight gigabit RAM in a, in a dual channel memory and then the other bank that would be paired up with it, a high latency two gigabyte RAM. So Ooh. you want them to be the same when you put them in. I thought you meant like they're both, they're both like a DDR, but they're just different, different sizes. You know, they're like four and eight. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. 
oh, but it, that, that, that works. It works, but not in optimal way, not in oh. the optimal way. So it will work slower, but it will not work in optimal speeds. Oh, I understand now. So you're not getting as much as you actually could out of the higher RAM module. So it's, it's less efficient. And in some cases, it actually won't work at all. All right. And as always, we're going to remind you of this multiple times. Check the motherboard specifications in your manuals. And it'll give you the required speeds, at least the minimums, and possibly the maximums of what your motherboard can handle. All right. So deep breath. The math portion of our day is over. We can now go talk about that tiny little chip that was on our RAM module and what it is. SPD or serial presence detect. It serves one purpose. When you plug that sucker into the computer, it immediately talks to the computer and says, hey, my name is RAM. I have eight gigabits and I operate at these speeds and at this latency. It talks to the machine and basically tells you, tells the machine what it's talking to and what it's working with. That is its sole purpose. So SPD, Serial Presence Detect. All right. When should we upgrade our RAM? Typically, when you're experiencing general slowness, general slowness, you get an insufficient memory error on a regular basis. Or if you start seeing your hard drive running constantly, anytime you're trying to process something, if you hear your hard drive just going crazy, it's called thrashing the drive, the hard drive. So, I get it. So, it starts reading and writing to the hard drive really quickly. Essentially what is happening is, is you've run out of RAM. And so it starts using your hard drive as a backup plan. And it uses what's called either a page file or a swap file. And so when your hard drive starts going crazy and it's reading and writing to your hard drive, basically it's using your hard drive as RAM. So it's storing information there temporarily while the RAM is full to be able to handle what you're trying to run. Here's the problem. These symptoms are also symptoms that you have a virus on your computer. Because you get the exact same symptoms if you have a virus operating. It's reading and writing to your hard drive really quick. It's generally slowing things down because it's eating up your RAM and it's trying to use up you know, system resources stuff like that, and you may get an insufficient error in the process because of this. It doesn't guarantee that that's the case. I'm just saying that both of these situations have the same symptoms. The question will be, did you suddenly experience this or are you generally experiencing this over time? Ian, and then we will get to Casey. Does this usually occur when it comes to like laptops, like specifically old laptops? What do you mean? Like the general uh, slowness? Yeah, like um like uh not really that, but needing to upgrade the RAM. Because I'm using like my laptop right now mm -hmm. and it has been so freaking slow. And I checked it, it has no viruses, okay. but it basically runs like like every 10 minutes. It takes like a good 10 minutes for things to process. And that could be an indicator that you may need RAM. It may help um, because over time, the, the processing load that programs we use increases. Older systems have a harder time handling it. So if you add RAM to an older system, you can extend the life of that system. Okay. So uh, that, that may be a case. Uh, sorry. One more thing I just want to add to that. 
Uh, it could also be bloatware and a bunch of software that's running in the background that is of the very computer. true as well because I had that problem as well. My computer was uh, using RAM and I didn't know where that RAM was going. So I just started uninstalling yeah. a bunch of stuff that started up when my system started up. And that when made you my start, computer boot up a lot faster. When you start looking for viruses, that's one of the first things you go look for is- Yeah, and blow air, You start looking at your startup menus and see what boots up, all that fun stuff. Yes, Casey. Yeah. Um, what type of virus um, protection would you recommend? Because I know there's some free ones, but uh, you always have that risk. My, my, you know? my thing with, here, here's the question I always ask, um, or, the, or the statement I always make. When something is free, how do they make their money? Uh, by you downloading it or using it or... How do they make money that way? Free. It's just so kind with of ads. like a backdoor. When Selling something data. is free, you are the product. So you are what is being sold. So Your I data, don't really, yeah, I don't have any uh, firewall. I did in the past, like the free ones. Okay. Like, uh, was it? Um, I I forget. But anyways, um, I don't have any on here because I'm like really careful about what I download. I got you. Because. Um, but, uh, but yeah, but I have noticed like this is a new laptop and I have noticed it's taking a while to load. I don't know if that's just you. because it's cheap and latency is like pretty high on it. I mean, I guess I just have to take it apart and see, huh? Well, I mean, <laughs> we'll, 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 you know, you'll be working on it more and more as you go through this class. But generally speaking, when it comes to security tools, there's a lot of really good free ones out there, but that's usually... You're talking about Kali Linux. You're talking um, about Wireshark, stuff like that. Now, with regards to antivirus and firewalls, I, you know, Kaspersky is a good one. Yes, uh, Nassim. Uh, Norton's not bad. I mean, there's, there's, a, there's a good few of them out there with the free ones. I'm always extremely leery, especially if you don't know much about them, because people running viruses will try to get you to download their software by acting as an antivirus, you'll get like a little, like if you've ever been surfing on Google, like we detected a virus on your machine, download our free thing for six free scans and you download it and congratulations, you just downloaded the virus you were trying to avoid. Um, so it's, it's one of those things that you gotta be leery about the programs you're going with. And unfortunately that's a really big one, uh, but we'll get into security and all that stuff a little bit later in the cohort that is coming, I promise. Uh, Babakar. Yeah, just uh, with regards to what uh, Kayla was saying, I said uh, most of these free antivirus, like there's always a catch. They, mm -hmm. you know, they trick you into, you know, uh, adding an extension to your, you know, <laughs> to your browser mm -hmm. or, you know, downloading something that they, you know, want you to download. So you have to be very careful like, as to which ones to, you know, go for. Yes. You know, yeah, it's, it's, they're very tricky. They might, and sometimes you might not even know it. You just keep on clicking next, 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 not knowing that you've been downloading all the stuff, you know. Or you give it root access. Phone. You give it root level root, access root, and it owns your system at that point. Exactly. And it's, it is very difficult to dislodge <laughs> it at that point. Yep. Without going like basically the, the full-blown king method and even that may not be enough. That's right. All right. Uh, so, is it, uh, so is it better to not have any antivirus than having a free virus, free antivirus? Uh, <laughs> I would say probably yes on that one. But usually if you have a Windows machine or something like that, they do have a basic level antivirus already there. So it's better to go with what is already there. They have Windows Defender Firewall. It does have a built-in antivirus and anti-spyware. It's a pretty interesting, you know, it's a decent suite that does a pretty good job. So it, I would say go with that rather than downloading a free one that you don't know much about. And don't just read customer reviews because those can be faked. Um, so you got to look for things in the way of um reputable sources where you're getting reviews 
with regards to that. So that's the big key. All right. So we talked about the page file or swap file. All right. So some of the things you need to consider, how much RAM do I need? How much is allowed by the operating system? Some oper operating systems have a ceiling as much as they can handle. Some CPU architectures have a ceiling. 32-bit architecture can only handle four gigs of RAM. It cannot handle anything more than that. You can put more in, it just won't use it. So we have to take stuff like that into account. Um, how many and what kind of memory modules are currently installed in my motherboard? How many can fit? Laptops, typically two. Desktops, typically four. Standard, if you have um, like a gaming PC or a larger ATX, you might be able to get more than four in your, um, you might have more than four slots to work with. How do I select and purchase an upgrade? Look and see what the specs are for your motherboard, what it's capable of handling, and you go from there. And then installing RAM. It's one of the easier things you can do. Um, even if you have like an all-in-one, they usually have just like a little panel on the back of the computer that pops open and you're right there at the RAM modules and you can insert more RAM if you want to or swap it out. So some of them do make it easy for upgrades. So how much do I need? Typical answer, as much as you can get, as much as you want to spend money on. All right. Operating system limits, we just talked about this. Windows 7 and 8 need minimum of two. 32-bit uh, ar architecture for a CPU, maximum of four. For Windows 7, you can go up to 16. Eight is 128. I think 10 is oh, like 1,000 over, like it's over a terabyte of RAM you can actually install and Windows 10 can handle it. You know, I don't know anybody who's gotten anywhere close to that, it would be kind of awesome to see what that operates like, but the average person isn't going to go anywhere near that. So, something to keep in mind. Oh, I know y'all are bored of hearing me talk, so it's time to climb. <laughs> Probably, Donnie. Yes, Galen. Doing that again? Yeah, so I missed like I missed way too much information um, when I was um, picking my kids up from outside and um, I'm taking notes and cop I'm copying and taking notes. So here we go. How do we find or how much memory do we have and how do we find it? So typically Windows is pretty straightforward. You go to the system app, your, your system applet or whatever. From there, go to the control panel. And that should be, you know, report to you exactly, you know, my system. We It'll don't tell see you exactly. Screen. You, you don't see my screen? I'm gesturing to it. You don't see it? Okay, hold on. I'm terrible about this. All right, here we go. Better? And leave him over there. There we go. We good? So. The system control applet, once you go to control panel, you go to system, system, and it will tell you everything about your system. It'll tell you what kind of CPU you have in there, how much RAM you have, what uh, you were operating of 32 or 64 bit operating system. It'll give you all of that information in there, including the amount of RAM you have. Or you can go into the BIOS or UEFI and from there, you can go in, in your main menu, you can find your system settings and it will tell you exactly how much RAM you have and it'll even tell you how many memory banks you have, whether or not you're operating on single, dual, triple or quad channel. So all that information is there in the BIOS. There's also some third party software you could use, no big deal. Um, most people don't use it to figure out how much RAM they have. On a Mac, 
you click the little Apple icon in the upper left hand side of your screen. You scroll down to where it says about this Mac, click on that. And then it'll open up a little window box there and it says overview, overview, display, storage, memory, support, resources. You click on memory and it will tell you how many RAM banks you have, how many memory banks you have, and what type of memory you have in each one. So on a Mac, that's how you would be able to check it out. Typically, again, laptops, you have two slots. Desktops, typically you have four. Questions on this? I encourage you, if you've never done this, go in and see how much RAM your system has <clears throat> at some point this evening. Physically installing, again, we'll, we'll go through this a little quickly because the steps really don't change much based on what we were talking about yesterday and earlier today. First, you power down that system, unplug it. What do we do after we do that? No matter what, power down and unplug, and then what do we do? What's the first thing we do? Hold on the power button. Indefinitely. So we're gonna sit there and just hold that button down. Five seconds. Five, five seconds. seconds, awesome. Hold the power down for five seconds, excellent. Uh, Christian and Donnie, why do we do that? Dissipating uh, leftover energy. Yeah. Dissipating the residual charge in our capacitors. Thank you very much, George. All right. After that, we can remove our access panel. And then from there, we should have pretty easy access to the RAM modules. Press down on the little tabs. It ejects your RAM modules up. You can take out the old ones, put in new ones. Or if you're just adding, you can just add new modules if you wish. Um, on all-in-ones, it's a little easier. Typically, there's a little access panel in the back. You literally open up that access panel, maybe like one or two screws. Um, heck, on the IMAX, I think it's literally just a button. You take like a pin or, uh, you know, a probe of some kind like this, and you just push that button, and it pops open the panel, and then you fold up the memory, and then you can swap out or add as you see fit. Whenever you're doing installing, if we're reaching inside of a computer, we need to have ESD protection, bracelet, glove, mat, what have you. Doesn't take much to destroy a chip. All right, lining up the notches before we install, making sure we do, we have a firm press down, we don't rock it back and forth. Straight down push into the slot. As noticed here. If the tabs are still out like this, it means your memory module has not been installed correctly. You need to press down until those tabs come up and lock into place. So like you see here, where they've come up and they grab inside a notch that's on the side of the memory module. Questions so far? All right, so if it doesn't snap in solidly like that, if it's the only RAM modules you have in there, you are likely gonna get a post error when you turn your, your system on because your RAM isn't installed properly. If you're adding new banks, like new memory banks to it, it likely will not recognize it because it won't see that it's there. If you have a partial connection, it will give you a post error and then you go in and fix it. Like we were saying before, if you're doing something like upgrading RAM and you get a post error, it's likely the last thing you were messing with. So go check and reseat your RAM to fix. Amaya. Is all type of laptop have the same size RAM? They may have the same size, but different generations and types. So it does mm -hmm. not mean it is universal. You wanna make sure that the type and generation of RAM is correct because each generation has different pin counts and that notch may be in different places. Okay. So you gotta make sure to check your documentation just to verify that the RAM you have will absolutely work where you're trying to put it. And that's our next point, check our documentation. Um, if the RAM value has not changed and you've added RAM, the module might not be installed correctly or the RAM banks may not be turned on in the BIOS. 
Double check it. If the computer does not boot or beeps or heard, that is a post error, it means it wasn't installed correctly. Open it up, reseat the RAM, you should be good to go at that point. Warning signs that something went wrong. The all fun BSOD error or blue screen of death for you Windows users. It typically comes up, tells you something very bad just happened, but thankfully it gives you a nice little code that'll tell you exactly what went wrong. You can look up that code and help you fix that problem. Other times, system works fine when you first start it, but begins to have problems as the day goes on. It means your RAM is getting used up. Other things, freezing, hesitating, system moving slowly. Could be RAM, could be a virus. System does not boot at all, beeps hurt instead. Again, we refer to the post error. So some things you might wanna try before going out and buying new RAM to upgrade your system. First, try rebooting it, see if that clears the memory out. If it's slowly getting eaten up over time, you have systems, you have programs running in the background that are eating up your memory. Those could be viruses, it could be bloatware, it could be a variety of things. Enter the BIOS, set the post to disable abbreviated start, and you can have it check for memory issues. And it'll tell you if the memory module is bad or something along that line. It does happen, even if it's a new memory module, on occasion, they can be bad. Quality control is not perfect. Check the memory in another system. That's an that's a easy way to check it. They do have RAM testers. You will play around with one in test out where you plug it in and it runs a check on the, on the RAM, lets you know if the RAM's good or not. So you'll be able to use one of those in a simulation in test outs in your labs that you have available today. Look for overheating or, you know, are your intakes on your computer dusty? Are your fans running all the time? Are the fans not running at all? That's another problem. If your system's hot and your fans aren't running. That's bad. If you have a laptop that is poorly named, laptops are not meant to be on your lap. If they're on your lap, they can't breathe. They need to be on a flat surface like a table because that's where all the intakes are on a laptop, they're underneath it. So if it's on your lap, the fabric from your jeans, or if it's on a pillow or a towel, you're blocking those air vents and it can't breathe. So it'll overheat and it will start to slow down and it can possibly damage your system. Power supply could be failing. And that's where we're talking about the intermittent power issues, or if it's overloaded and doesn't have enough power to go around for everything, it can make it seem like it's slow. So you can test your power supply they have testers for it if you're in an uh, enterprise environment, or you can swap it out with another power supply, see if it fixes the problem. Yes, Ume. Um, hi, I just want to share my thought. I was thinking that if you could push the customer service part at the end of the class and the, these uh, technical lectures uh, um, in, in, in a row, that would be mm -hmm. helpful. Well, we just did our last, B, that was our last BM, BSM today. All right, thank you. So we you. don't have any more of those. So, but oh, yeah, I appreciate it. No problem, I appreciate it. Yeah, those are, for, that was the last one of those today. All right. Testing the software, or you can test them using software just to make sure everything's okay. Regardless, you know, we'll revisit this here in a little bit. I am not gonna go through the steps here, we all, can read it pretty easily. We do have the slides in there. Again, for brevity, the steps are very similar to everything else we've done in the previous two T sessions we talked about. So it's just slight variations. So later on, if you are so inclined, you can read through and see those. All right, there are two videos here. I'm not gonna play them. I encourage you, please go through the slides on your, you know, in your own time when you have a moment. Watch these, they're Professor Messer. He does a really good job of breaking these concepts down into pretty simple bite-sized chunks. So there's two videos for that. 
I encourage it. Again, it's in the link for the slides we are going through today. <clears throat> we have five questions to, you know, to free time. Yes, Christian. Uh, I just wanted to ask, like, personally, like, uh, when I do go back through the slides later on tonight, um, would you recommend just, like, doing index cards, like, to, like, make bullet points for myself? Or, like, do you have another recommendation? Well, index cards are great. I mean, flashcards are wonderful for, like, the, the pin counts because it's real quick. DDR2, okay. Sodium, you know, how many pins? You know, mm -hmm. those are really quick ones. Also, Quizlet's good for that um but it's again it's it's one of those things that you have to find what really works for you um sometimes just write you know changing the wording of what you see in the slides into your own words helps you process that information better right okay um, so that's another way to do it like i i don't like encouraging direct copying of information that doesn't help you memorize it you got to change it and make it your own All right, thank you for that. Mm -hmm. Appreciate it. No problem, Donnie. Uh, yeah. Uh, for the Coursera, it's just week one that we're doing. Hold on. So far. Let Let's finish this, and then I promise I will answer your questions. I just uh, I thought, for those I who got to go, I got to get anything. Do what? Sorry. You what? I thought you, I thought you were just answering anything. Like no, 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 no not anything. Not anything Sorry. yet. Sorry. <laughs> I promise I haven't forgotten about you, Donnie. I will stick around and help you <laughs> and answer your questions. All right, we got to get over 50%. Come on. Who checked out already? Getting there. It's a tiny bit more, 30 more seconds, and then we will go over them real quick. All right. Here we go. So first question, the RAM has not changed after install. What is the likely problem? It was not installed correctly. The result of not installing it correctly, you would get a pat, you know, you might get a post error, but if you don't get a post error and it's not seen, then it's still possible faulty install. Yes, Christian. You're muted if you're talking. No, I just left my hand up. My bad. No worries. All right, number two. If the RAM does not fit easily, you should rock the card back and forth. And with increasing pressure to try to make it fit. No, false. That is a good way to break a module. Number three, why is rebooting an effective troubleshooting technique? It clears the RAM memory. That's volatile memory. When it loses power, it wipes it clean. So once everything's wiped clean, you're starting you know, with a clean slate. When you start back up, you should have your RAM cleared at that point. If it starts slowing down over time, there's other issues going on. It may not be your RAM module. And four, what is the first step to installing a new RAM card? Turn off the power. I hope we all got that one. Finally, which is not an indicator that you need more RAM. The fan running constantly. That's an indication of overheating. Questions, comments, concerns on this as far as to RAM? Yeah. 
Yeah, like right. memory overload. But doesn't the uh, isn't there an indicator like something could be wrong if your fan is running constantly? Yes, oh. your CPU is overheating. Your cooling system is not working. You may not have thermal paste on your uh, in between okay. your. There's a ton of reasons for overheating. There could be debris right. in front of it, so it's not breathing. So, right. uh, but yeah. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. But we'll get we will get into a lot of that stuff. So, no worries. But now we should be able to define system memory and describe the different tech, uh, technologies, articulate the process, including key questions to answer, upgrading memory, determine how to select it, go through the installation process again, some of the common problems we may experience, and where to kind of go look for answers to that or how to solve them. Questions, comments, concerns, complaints, other than the fact that we went six minutes over. All right. 